sure they'll be wonderful. Robert Costa, where are you spending Thanksgiving? Post reporter extraordinaire and host of the Washington Week in Review. Are you actually doing Washington Week in Review live this week? We will have Maggie Haberman and John Meacham on for a Thanksgiving special in Washington Week, all about President Trump and his impeachment process. will be pretty cool. But I'll be back in Pennsylvania just for the day. Good for you. Good for you. It's important to be with family and friends. Um, I am curious, Robert, about uh, the release of the transcripts last night. I talked with Michael Shear at the beginning of the show about them. I've read the one from OMB, not the other. Uh, I think confirmation bias will inform almost every story about this. What was your take on these two transcripts? Well, you're seeing now reports in the Sandy testimony about OMB officials resigning over this entire process of Ukrainian aid. So that's what jumped out uh, in the biggest way last night. You see at least some new unrest, new evidence of unrest within the administration. Uh, uh, what signs are those? Well, that Mark Sandy testified that a couple OMB officials were unhappy with how this process played out, and they resigned in part in protest. But we need to hear more about who these people were and why exactly they did it. No, no, no. I, but but I mean that that's in the past. You're you're not. I th- I misunderstood. I thought you were saying you've got reporting that people are upset about these these transcripts after they were published who are no, who are still with the government nothing like that nothing yet I mean, the transcripts in general these are driving the process in terms of underscoring different parts of this, this impeachment inquiry but I mean, what's explosive to you what do you exactly reference? well i i don't see anything in here i think lee zeldin called for it to be released because in fact the people who are defending the president are going to say look right there there's a the explanation was offered that this was aid being withheld because the president wanted the Europeans to step up. And I've been covering Vice President Pence and President Trump on this for a long time. They've always cited the need for Europeans to step up and to take a bigger part in countering Ukrainian aid. The challenge they're facing, though, is as much as they are making the argument on corruption, some of them were doing a more coherent job of than others. I mean, Vice President Pence never has spoken about Vice President Biden or Burisma. You did have other people in the administration, including the president, referencing Biden. So this this case that it was just all about nationalism and, and retreating a little bit and having the U.S. oversee all these different nations and their corruption issues, that, that's just not the full story. All right, so let, let's go to your, your Washington Week in Review special, because I'll be watching that with great interest. And for full disclosure, everyone in the audience knows this, but someone might be tuned in for the first time because they're driving forever. I, uh, I, I worked for President Nixon from 1978 to 1980 in San Clemente. I worked for him again, 1989 to 1990. I spent hundreds of hours with him during the construction of his library and during the writing of The Real War. I am now back as the president and CEO of the Nixon Foundation, living a bi-coastal life as a result. So I know Nixon, I know the Watergate story, I know the impeachment. I am of the opinion that we started out with the belief that Watergate would inform the Ukraine inquiry. And in fact, the Ukraine inquiry has informed Watergate. And I've come to the conclusion that if the economy then had been like the economy now, or if the media then had been like the media now, Nixon would have survived. Uh, Is that point of view represented on Washington Week in Review this week? No, we, we're, I'm planning to talk about how the 24-7 media environment now has changed everything for President Trump. He also has a conservative media uh, apparatus and, and environment out there that really bolsters him at these key moments. And you, you saw President Nixon often struggling with any kind of real war room to counter what was going on on Capitol Hill. And there was only a few channels and they were airing wall to wall coverage. And it was driven by the House Democrats who were investigating him in 73, 74. And there is a valid point to be made that if if Nixon was around in this day and age, he would be boosted in a a significant way by allies throughout the media in a way Nixon was not. But in 74, I think the challenge for President Trump is as much as he's boosted by the, the right, he's also struggling to cut through with some independent voters. You see the polls show some at least people concerned about his conduct. But the problem is, I noticed this when I'm out on the campaign trail, so many voters are busy with their lives. They're tuning a lot of this out. And so the the critics of President Trump are not able to gain immense traction like the critics of Nixon did in the 70s when the whole country was paying close attention. Do you think with a media like today, Nixon would have survived? 
Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, Richard Nixon was was as much of a opponent of the press as President Trump. He didn't use the terms like fake news and all that with that kind of vitriol all the time. Um, but it, 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 the issues are so different. President Nixon, a, a burglary, a 72 campaign, uh, was much more inside of the White House. This this is a complicated foreign policy, pressure campaign, abuse of power or not. It's hard. I think it would be the first to agree. It's not These are apples and oranges in some respects. They are. I, I've made the argument, I meet the press, that the previous two impeachments had date time stamps on them. There was a Watergate burglary. In fact, there was also an Ellsberg burglary that really are very un- easy for understand. And there were tapes. Right. So that we, not only did we have a time date stamp, we had tapes. We also had a time date stamp of when President Clinton had his affair with uh, Ms. Lewinsky. And we had tapes of the president being deposed. We had a transcript. This there is no first person testimony. We have a transcript that people read Rashomon like and say, what is this? As I say, this isn't an offense or an impeachable offense. It's not even significant. And other people read that transcript and they say, this is the end of days. It's just, I don't think you can sustain impeachment in this environment absent. And I want to be clear, Robert, you and I both agree. If we get new evidence, like Rudy Giuliani calling the president and said, let's lean on Zelensky because he'll take Biden out of the primary. If we had that on tape, that would be over, right? It's hard to speculate at this point, but you have to, as a reporter, you look at Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer, and at first you could say, is he a Harry Hopkins type figure just operating in a rogue way, doing the bidding of the president? We've seen that throughout U.S. history. But then you keep learning about uh, possible financial entanglements Mr. Giuliani has had, and it does raise flags as a reporter. What else is going on here? Because even if the president didn't have the intent, well, what was going on with, with Rudy Giuliani? Was President Trump in any way involved? If not, he should make that clear. But if so, what was the extent of his conversation with all this, this dealings with the, the meddling of uh, for, the mixing of foreign policy and personal finance? But I, let's go back to a second. I want my audience. We got Steelers fans here, Robert. They won't know who Harry Hopkins is. The president's first friend lived in the White House, had been secretary of commerce, had been the head of the Public Works Administration, but he had no job when President FDR sent him to London in 1941, uh, not a back channel, a very obvious front channel, but not regular, but certainly legit. Uh, Harry Hopkins wasn't in any way, shape, or form, in my view, illegitimate, right? Harry Hopkins, you know, had his own critics back then, as we know, but he was seen as someone who was an envoy for the president that was understood as an envoy. The, the, the difference, I would argue, with uh, Harry Hopkins and Giuliani is that a lot of people within the administration were not clear about what Giuliani's role was, whereas Hopkins was seen as someone with a vague role, but someone who always had the president's blessing. It wasn't always clear to many of these officials inside the administration if Giuliani was at that level and if they, he was actually directing policy in the president's name. You know, there's a great book out there called The Hopkins Touch. Maybe ask John Meacham about this if you get a chance down the road, if not on the show. Uh, Hopkins went in 1934 as well uh, for the president and unsettled every diplomat in the Foreign Service. They didn't know who this FDR guy was. They didn't know. It's a sort of similar period of time. FDR elected in 32. Hopkins making a tour of Europe in 34 because FDR didn't trust all of the Hoover people. I mean, it's almost an exact parallel. And it just, it goes on. It's like Kissinger. They didn't tell the, the State Department that Kissinger was in China. They didn't tell the Department of Defense. I just... I don't think it's going to fly, and Robert. Makes it so different, Hugh. I, I was at President Trump's rally last night in Florida. Oh, interesting. Full reporter covering Vice President Pence. I was in Sunrise, and you just notice that this is so different historically because it's during a, a re-election campaign. We've never seen this before, and so many of these voters I talked to at the Trump rally said they wanted to see the people decide. And so President Trump has a new tool in his pocket because he can say. Let, let's just have an election in November rather than doing this impeachment. And the, his voters at least seem to re- respond to that point. Quick exit question. Happy Thanksgiving to your entire family. I always enjoy seeing them. Uh, just um, do you expect a trial or is this is this going to get either sidetracked by Mitch McConnell or is it going to be not coming out of the House? What's your best guess, Robert Costa, the Wednesday? He's an institutionalist. He's a constitutional man. 
if this actually gets through the House and the president's impeached, he'll have a trial, but it'll be two to three weeks. Robert Costa, happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Come back, America. I've got the rest of the Jeremy Corbett interview right after the break here on The Hugh Hewitt Show.